Good evening, everyone. I'm Ted Everingham. I'm on the board of directors here at the War Memorial on the shores of Lake St. Clair in Gross Point, Michigan, an institution that's been around since 1948 or 1950. You're about to join us for our American Values series. This is, I think, the third program we've done. Tonight, the topic is what the polls got right and what they got wrong about the 2020 election. And we have with us to explore that subject and talk about it, uh, three really distinguished political science uh, students, professors, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Martinez, would you raise your hand so we'll know which of you is, there you are. Dr. Martinez, wave at us. Okay. Uh, Dr. Martinez is at the University of Florida. He's talking to us from, from Gainesville this afternoon, this, this evening. Julio Borges, raise your hand, there he is. Julio is at the University of Michigan, Dearborn, and Jeff Hill. Jeff is, there's Jeff, he's from Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. These are all have doctorates and they all teach and research and speak about things in politi the political science world. We also have with us from Albion College, a couple of students. I'll start with Caitlin, Caitlin Cummings. Caitlin is a uh, junior at Albion, majoring in history and political science. And then we have Chris Kerber, who's a sophomore economics and political science. And both of them are part of the Albion College Gerald R. Ford Institute for Leadership in Public Policy and Service. So with that bit of introduction, let me, uh, let me turn these guys loose. Is polling just dead as a result of what happened in 2016 and 2020? Is it hopeless? Which of you would like to address that first? I, I can take a stab. I, I don't think it's hopeless, but it's changing because the techniques that worked years and years ago do not work as well. Um, the techniques that work, well, give you a case in point. The problem started when we were first, when people were first trying to poll how well Barack Obama would do in the primaries. And they were regularly underestimating, at least in the beginning, they were underestimating his strength. And that's because polling is both a kind of science and an art. There's a science to it in terms of samples and things like that, but there's an art to it when you have to figure out which of the people responding to you is actually gonna vote. And they knew young people did not vote in primaries. The only problem was for them that Obama attracted a lot of young people and they did vote for him for primaries. And we're facing something of that same kind of problem. Um, we're just not accessing people as well. And we, it, it's not insurmountable, but it is a problem. Michael? You're muted, Michael. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I, I think Jeff's right. Um, it's, uh, it is an increasing challenge, and I think Jeff hit the nail on the head. And if figuring out who, which candidates voters like is challenge enough, um, figuring out who's actually going to act on those preferences is, is a bit tougher. Um, and because that is so variable, I mean, some people sit out and, you know, they vote in presidential election years, but they sit out in midterm years, or they vote when they see a really attractive candidate and, and, and then they sit out um, when they don't. Um, so, um, so a lot of the issues that, um, that, that we face have been around for a long time, but as Jeff has said, the technologies are changing and people's behavior and interacting with the technologies are changing. Um, and, and part of that is, you know, um, people get calls on their cell phones now and everybody has caller ID on their cell phone and nobody answers calls they don't recognize. Uh, and, um, and so that's a problem, that's a what we would call a representation problem, um, getting people to participate in surveys. Um, there are, uh, as Jeff alluded to, there are some ways around that. Uh, we do some internet surveys. Um, but there are some sampling challenges in the internet surveys as well. Um, and, and, and so I think Jeff is, um, I, I think Jeff is right. I agree that there's still something to polling. Um, I would add to that, and, and Julio may want to pick up on this, um, that 
some of the errors that we see um, are really salient to us because they are in close elections. And a lot more states have become competitive at the presidential elect, uh, at the presidential level. Um, so we were used to, you know, big industrial states like Michigan being competitive for a long time. Um, but now, you know, states like Nevada and New Hampshire are competitive. Uh, and, and so there's more opportunity for an error to become salient um, in, in, uh, as more states become competitive. So if you get a, you know, an 8% error in Utah, nobody would care because it's going to go Republican anyway. Um, but there are more states that are competitive. And so there's more opportunities for these errors to become salient as we, as we read about them. Yeah, Julio. Yeah, I think, I, especially with the last two cycles, with 2016 and, 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 and 2020, um, I think part of the the hand wringing that we're all engaged in with regard to polls now is in part due to the methodological challenges, but it's also, at least in part, uh, due to um, some defining aspects of of the of of, of the climate. Um, so in, in go, going back to 2016, um, you have a lot of late deciding voters. It's a, it's a volatile environment in, in a number of states. Um, and even a well-crafted, well-executed survey that gives you the proverbial snapshot of public opinion, even a well-done survey is not well-equipped to capture the dynamics of a volatile volatile environment. So you don't pick up, for example, um, late deciders um, going, going to Trump. Even a good survey isn't, isn't going to pick that up. Um, and and you know, going back to what, what uh, M Michael said, you know, in, in battleground states, battleground states by definition are, are close. Um, and again, even a well-crafted survey um, is not going to get, you know, it's not going to give you the same traction in a close environment. Surveys aren't designed to, to do that. Um, so I think part of, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that, uh, that, 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 that polling itself is, is, is dead. Um, but I think we, we as, well, both as practitioners, but also as consumers of the results, um, also have to be mindful of the, the, the built-in limitations of the methodology and, and resist the temptation to invest more certainty into the results than, than are really there. Uh, because, yeah, because even, even well, well done surveys um, can lead, lead you astray, okay? Um, yeah. I, I also think one of the problems is what gets the biggest press and that is the bad surveys. You know, every survey is making one particular prediction and then someone comes out with, no, 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 the person everyone's predicting is gonna lose is gonna win by a landslide. And that's headlines in the newspapers. Um, and I saw that in Illinois, they were predicting um, God, a while ago uh, that Rod Blagojevich, who later went to prison, this is before prison, um, he was going to lose. And there was only one poll which said that, and it got a ton of press. Um, when you when you hear a poll, any poll can be wrong. You know, like you were just saying, Julio was just saying, any poll can be wrong. So you don't you can't make your opinion on one poll. You got to look at three or four or more of them. If they're all going in the same direction, well, that should give you a little more confidence. But you've had that one outlier. Um, it either means that the guy is really brilliant and really caught something no one else did, but more likely it's because he messed up. He's, yeah, he's just wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, Chris, in or... addition to that, uh, Julio talked about the environment and, and, and what's, what's interesting or challenging for us now, uh, part of the challenge is that polls are part of the environment and people react to those. Um, right, so you can you can get some sort of you know um, get on the bandwagon effect for candidates, um, but in 2016, I think there you know there may have been some complacency on the part of the Democrats. Right, so, I mean lots of press, lots of 
uh, media outlets were saying, you know, Clinton had a 85% chance of winning or something. And so, um, so her supporters may have gotten complacent, or it may have been that, um, that some supporters of hers kind of were weak supporters and wanted to cast a protest vote and voted for the Green Party or another third party or something, uh, thinking that she was going to win. And anyway, um, and, and so, so, you know, so yes, the environment matters and polls are part of the environment that, pe and there's this feedback loop going yeah. on. The, uh, the, the interesting little twist on, on, on the, the Clinton 2016 story, though, is that in part, you know, you know going back, you know, one of the things uh, about the, the Clinton campaign is that some of their strategic decisions, for example, decisions about candidate travel, uh, were made because the campaign had decided to uh, downplay polling data, right? They were they were reliant on on on, on other analytics, kind of pushed the polling data aside, and came to you know they made these great decisions that gosh we don't really have to spend any time in Wisconsin and gosh we don't really have to spend any time in in Michigan, and um, yeah, and, and we had four years of fun after that. But um, it, yeah, it, so it is kind of interesting with, with in the Clinton case. You're, you're right, polling is part of the environment and it was a part of the environment that the campaign made a you know, very deliberate decision to overlook. You know? did, we, did, we learn, did we learn something about polling in 2016 that shaped, that changed the process for 2020? Well, there were decisions to simply do more polling in 2020, especially more state level polling. Um, you know, that, that, was, that was a recommendation. Uh, the American Association for Public Opinion Research did a, put, it, put out a report after 2016. Uh, it was kind of a post-mortem on, on, on uh, the performance of polls in 2016. One of their recommendations was that there simply needed to be more polls done, especially state level polls. And, and, and that, did, that did happen. I mean, there simply was, was more data uh, available in 2016. Um, there were also uh, the, the recommendations about waiting to, to take into account uh, the, the educational composition of, of, of samples. Uh, so yeah, th there, there, were, there were changes. I mean, and there really was a, a concerted effort to take stock of what had Gone wrong and gone wrong in 2016, and and, and make some adjustments. I, Julio and Jeff, I don't know if you if, if if you could verify this. I've heard this, but not been able to verify it. Um, that pollsters or some pollsters um, looked at what they had done in 16, and and when they try to get rural areas, right, the, and that's important because of the rural urban divide, right, in in American politics. Um, that when they tried to um, sample in rural areas, they they thought they had a you know a good enough sample in rural areas, but it turned out that um, their analysis was that they didn't get rural enough. They were getting like county seats, right? Um, so they would get like Traverse City in Michigan, but not the rural areas outside of Tra Traverse City. Um, and so the um, and and so I, they said before the uh, election they thought they had corrected that, um, but I I that I'd heard that, but I don't know if Jeff or Julio had heard the same thing or or can verify it. No, that's an interesting story. No, I yeah. I, I, I can't say anything one way or the other about it. But no, I I can't either. Though it makes sense, and yeah. my bet is even if they did go out, they'd have problems getting people. I think um, that's right, Jeff. Yeah. Well, the, uh, it's, a, it's just it's just a, a physical logistic challenge in, right. in on top of all that, right? Adds to expense, adds to time, need more people, so on. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask Chris and Caitlin from Albion College if you have any questions, please jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, so we've talked a lot, you know, about what's happened in 2016 and 2020 and how they, you know, kind of everyone changed their game plan from 16 to 20. What do you guys expect to see as we look towards the midterms in 2022 and then on to the presidential in 2024? 
um, I think there's chaos. Be, oh, oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, 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 it's fine. You. No arguing, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I expect there's going to be a lot. Um, I would expect to see more innovation and, and a much bigger push um, toward online polling. I mean, cause, uh, do, doing doing survey research over the phone uh, is is it, it is becoming a nest of thorns. I don't I don't think it's it's it's, a, it's not a, a dying it's not a dead methodology, but. Uh, it's becoming increasingly problematic, but you know, and, and we've already touched on, on on a lot of those problems. But it's, but I, you know, I wanted to, with regard to that, about where we go from here, um, um, and it touches. I want to touch on something that that Michael brought up. You know, the, the problem in reaching rural areas, um, as the technology of survey research moves forward. You're still running into these, these these problems because you know what parts of the country are not wired. Well, it's these rural areas, right? They don't have good cell phone service. Uh, they don't have good you know good inter internet service. Um, so you know, yeah, yeah. Those you know, f folks in remote remote rural areas have always been hard to reach, regardless of survey mode. Um, and even as we move forward, and I would expect to see, uh, you know, a, a lot more movement toward toward web-based survey research. But yeah, even the, the the rural those rural constituencies are still going to be a and it, and and that becomes more together. that becomes more salient as the political divide between rural and urban areas expands, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's also a problem in our definition of what's rural. Um, in Illinois, I was I was just traveling and I was in a community which was definitely rural 10 years ago when I passed through it. And now, well, there's still an awful lot of farm. There's still a lot of rural homes and everything, but there are also all these developments coming up. So is this a rural community or not? It may fit within the definition, but it might be more suburban. So part of it is we have to tighten up what we mean. It's not a problem, let's say in Wyoming, or I lived in North Dakota for a short time. Nobody lives there. So it wouldn't be a problem defining rural there. But in places like Michigan and Illinois, um, it's not absolutely clear to me what's considered rural and what's not. Good point. Good point. Uh, by the way, I want to mention that Patrick McLean is with us. Patrick is a director of the Ford Institute at Albion College that I mentioned earlier. But if you look in the chat section, you'll see that he put up a link uh, to um, an evaluation, an article on the evaluation of the 2016 election polls um, in the United States, which might be interesting for all of us later. Caitlin, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have a question? Yes, I actually do have a question. Um, so I was kind of wondering, as we were talking, um, listening to us talk about how the information is gathered and you know what we look for as we're doing polling activities um, and I was curious who or what communities are historically left out of the polls and how does this impact the validity of the results of these polls so um, so increasingly everybody uh, <laughs> uh, we've had uh, some significant uh, decline in response rates uh, over over time, um, when uh, we talked a little bit last week, I made the comment that you know had had George Gallup had the uh, response rates to his surveys back in the late '40s and the in the early '50s that we do now, he probably would have thrown you know thrown his hands up and said this is you know this is uh, this this may not be any good because so few people are responding to surveys. Um, and, um, you know, so, so, so it is, but it is true that, um, that, you know, there are historical patterns, rural areas, uh, some minority voters are, are, are left out. Um, there, there are some things you can do, Julio and Jeff mentioned, you can do some weighting, you can do some oversampling in, in areas to try to pick those up. Um, but, but they do, uh, they do remain uh, challenges here. And, and when you're trying to build, for example, a, a sample of, say, 1,500 respondents, and it takes 135,000 calls, 
to get 1500 completed interviews. Um, e even, even the waiting leaves you a little queasy uh, uh, about the quality of your, uh, of, of your sample. I mean, the, 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 the reality about, you know, polls about politics is there are an awful lot of folks out there who are just not interested in politics. So when they're contacted, and invited to an answer some questions about politics, their answer is probably going to be uh, no thank you, assuming they're in a good mood. And otherwise, then the answer is probably something different. Um, uh, so you know, one of the big biases that we're always correcting for is just we, we, we tend to get uh, a, a pool of respondents who are simply more engaged in politics than most of their neighbors. Um. And there's always the problem of respondents who tell you things, but don't, it doesn't really matter. And I was one of those ones. They asked me when I first moved to the area, what news programs I watched. And they gave me a dozen names of people. And um, they kept telling, the person kept telling me, I won't get paid if you don't answer all the questions. So I gave answers. Um, I have no idea who I what answers I gave. So um, when you, it's, it's like we could have a poll now, who's going to win in the next presidential election? Um, political science is a big part of my life. I still have no idea who I would vote for in 2024. Um, yeah, no, no idea. So, but I'm sure, but I know there are polls out making predictions already. Well, there are, and that's going to be, there'll be a floodgate of those as we get closer and closer. And, you know, it used to be elections happened every four years. It seems now it's every three years and 10 months. Um, you start all over again. I've heard the phrase shy Trump voters. What's that mean? And is it significant? It, it means that people may be, um, for, and, and that it's the shy Trump voter is not the only manifestation of this, um, that people may be hesitant to tell you what they really think. Um, and um, that it's because um, people may think, or, or Trump voter may believe, or some Trump voters may believe, um, that um, they're, they're talking to somebody who doesn't like Trump voters. And so they don't want to, you know, they don't want to admit that they're a Trump voter because they don't want to get in an argument or, or, or appear to look bad to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to an interviewer. Um, another manifestation of that is um, people who um, uh, will say that they will support a black candidate, but in reality, when it gets down to in when they get into the voting booth, they can't pull that lever. Um, we saw that in Florida in the midterm elections in 2018. So we had um, we had a gubernatorial race uh, that was very close. Uh, between uh, uh, Ron DeSantis won the gubernatorial race. He's now a Republican governor, and he was running against um, he was running against a, a Democratic candidate who was black. Um, and at the same time, we had a concurrent U.S. Senate race um, where the um, the then incumbent governor Rick Scott was challenging the then incumbent Senator Bill Nelson, and both of those candidates were old white guys. Um, and the polls right before the election um, said both, both races were going to be close, right? I mean, it was, it, it's Florida, it's a competitive state. They were, you know, everybody knew what was going on. Um, and the, uh, but it looked like uh, Andrew Gillum, who was the Democratic candidate for governor, was a couple of points ahead relative to where Bill Nelson, the Democratic candidate for Senate, was. Um, in the end, um, Nelson got a larger fraction, both of, the, both of the Democrats lost, but Nelson got a, a slightly higher fraction of the vote than the, for Senate than Gillum did for governor, leading me to believe that there were some, um, there were some voters uh, who were polled um, who, um, who said that they would vote for a black candidate for governor, but they really wouldn't. Um, and so I think the shy Trump voter is just another manifestation of that, right? Where 
um, where, where respondents may tell surveyors one thing uh, because of what we call social desirability in the trade, uh, but, uh, but th they won't actually act on those preferences that they've expressed. How do we fix that? Is there a way to work uh, our way around that? <laughs> I wish I knew, Julio. <laughs> yeah. I, ha, yeah. having, I, and I agree with everything Mike said, except I'm not sure I believe there was a shy Trump voter. Um, there are people who are hesitant to tell you what their true preferences is. They think you look down upon them. But I don't think this is the case. I haven't seen most of the Trump voters I know are um, very upfront with their Trump voting. <laughs> Where we did see it was years ago when a number of groups were uh, sponsoring initiatives to cut back on um, LBGTQ rights. And they were public initiatives and they would take, they would get in the ballot. And there were all kinds of polls, in, one in Colorado, for example, which showed that this was going to lose, I mean, by a landslide. And then it won by a landslide. Um, people just didn't want to admit that, you know, they were going to vote against anybody's rights. And yet they did. So I, I think we see that clearly, it still exists. I don't think, I, I, I think the, the, I think the shy Trump voter is more of a myth to justify not believing polls. Uh, well, I think I think the phrase is probably inaccurate, but it describes the phenomenon of someone for one reason or another not wanting to give his opinion to a pollster. Uh, maybe he doesn't know. Uh, maybe he doesn't want to admit that. And maybe he wants to uh, feel better about a particular speaking in favorably about a particular candidate, but that's not really what he means. Uh, but the phenomenon seems to be to be there. Yeah, it was, it was a, a real interesting piece of, of of data about about the shy Trump voter, the whole shy Trump voter phenomenon. Um, and this was a morning consult poll from from the fall of of, of, of twenty twenty. And what they did is um, they had a, a a phone sample and an accompanying um, online sample. Uh, both sets of respondents were asked the, the standard trial heat question, uh, who did you plan to vote for for president? Um, the expectation was that um, perhaps Trump would do less well among the phone, the phone respondents because they were the ones who had to share their preference with another person, right? And, and, and that's what the whole shy Trump voter business is all about. You don't want to express your support for Trump. Well, what, what, what the, the study found was uh, really no difference in the distribution of vote preference uh, between the online respondents and the telephone respondents. When uh, you dig a little deeper into the data, uh, you find there's a little nuance to this, which is kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, one slice of respondents where there did, did seem to be some support for the shy Trump voter uh, thesis, it was among, actually it was among better educated, it was among college educated respondents, okay? And, and, and that's where the shy, which, which when you think about it, that makes sense, right? Uh, because they're the ones who are not supposed to be supporting Trump Right, so they're the and and they're the ones who are most likely to be um, attuned to the social desirability um, influences, um, and so um, it, it's 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 you know it's like a lot of lot of things in in in, in politics. There's there's a a grain of of truth to it enough to sort of keep the myth alive, um, but but yeah, but there is there is nuance nuance to it. I think mean, you know there's there's something to the shy to the shy Trump story, um, but boy, you have you have to qualify the story too. I I, I think you're right, and I I guess that's going to be a tough one to design around. I want to raise a question that's been raised in different words by a couple of our viewers. I'll try and synthesize the two. Uh, one mentioned that one of you had mentioned that the larger response rate. Um, 
because of the two, or you're seeking a larger response rate because of the 2016 failed polling. And would that, would, would that somehow with the failures in 2016 make people more distrustful of polls? Another person put it this way, is there a, a greater negative impact on the political discipline as a whole due to the errors in polling? Or does polling get the elect elections wrong? Um, does that degrade the relevance of the political science research as a whole and that moving forward, the work of political scientists like you three gentlemen uh, will lose public trust, that, that people just won't trust polls anymore and they'll become irrelevant? Uh -oh. Well, when I when I when I saw the when I, I'm looking at at the, at the text right here, when I saw the reference to political scientists losing public trust, I I, I just take that as a given. I, I, I thought that I thought that had happened years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of thinking back to what we just talked about with regard to the the the, the shy Trump voter. Um, yes, there, 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 there's a, a, a lot that the, that the polling industry, that the polling community has to come to grips with. Um, but you know what, there, there are a whole lot of other things about electoral politics that need fixing. And Response rates and polls is probably fairly far down the list of, of things that we truly, truly need to be uh, wor wor worrying about. Um, and I think, um, yeah, sort of the, the you know degradation of, of 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 the process is is a much it's a much bigger thing. I mean, one of the things about the shy Trump voter is we we have to underscore this is the shy Trump voter. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to be talking about a shy Biden voter four years from now, um, uh, you know, or, a, you know, a, a shy Nikki Haley voter. I mean, I think the, the shy Trump voter phenomenon, if to the extent that exists, is, you know, it's a, it's a product of Trump and his particular um, style, shall we say, of of politics and, 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 and campaigning. And um, so, yeah, there, <laughs> yeah there, are, there are a lot of other things that uh, to go beyond, back beyond the polling that we need to be worrying about, yeah. Yeah, and, and one of those things, that I, I mean, the two big issues in polling, and sometimes they get conflated a little bit, um, one is um, representation. So when we were talking about declining response rates and and trying to find uh, uh, rural voters who would talk to pollsters, um, those are representation issues, right? Um, that, that are we talking to a good sample that is representative of the population of interest? Um, and, and then the other issue is measurement, right? Are, there, are those people telling you the truth or are they answering questions in the way that you would interpret it um, uh, faithful to what their real real opinions are, um, and so um, and so those are those those oftentimes get conflated, but they're really separate kinds of issues. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if the I I, I think Julio is probably right. Um, there is some I do think there is still some measurement error there. Um, but um, and and I and, and there are some differences in measurement. I, I believe what Julio said about the morning consult experiment. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, but but there but there are some differences in how people respond on internet surveys versus uh, telephone or in person surveys. Um, that um, you get a little bit more extreme answers. Um, we did a poll in Florida in uh, 2017. Uh, in which we ask internet respondents and, and uh, telephone respondents a similar uh, or basically the same survey as best we could. Um, and we ask them their position, we ask them their positions on issues, but we also ask them, okay, so what do you think um, Governor Scott's position is on that issue and Senator Nelson's position is on that issue? Um, the telephone respondents, um, I, we got a lot of don't knows on that. 
um, you know, they wouldn't say what what it, the governor's position was on an issue or a U.S. senator's position was on an issue. They'd say they didn't know. The Internet respondents would take a guess um, and that often guess pretty reasonable things. They would say, you know, I think, you know, Scott is the Republican governor. He probably has a conservative position on these issues. And and Nelson's kind of a moderate liberal Democrat. And he probably has kind of a moderate liberal position on these issues. Um, so you get so so I think that, that there are some differences. Um, Julio is probably right that we're going to probably do more Internet surveys. Depending on what we ask, we need to be mindful of the fact that people may answer the surveys or some survey questions differently on the internet than they do uh, on the mm -hmm. phone. It's interesting. There's, there's another problem with trust in political science. And it's similar to the problem, if you're old enough, you saw with, are cigarettes dangerous? And you see it now with climate change a little more a couple of years ago than now. And that is political scientists tend to talk in probabilities. And, you know, if you want the definitive answer, can we say absolutely, yes, this is true? Um, no, we can't. Um, we, again, we can say, well, it's significant, which means 5% of the time it's gonna be wrong. Um, and yet people want definitive answers. I'll, let me give you an example, and maybe my colleagues can weigh in on this. Nate Silver says he wasn't wrong in 2016 because he predicted, I think it was like a 15% chance that Trump would win. Well, I, I, I think that's hedging a little too much, but technically he's right. He said there was only an 85% chance that Hillary Clinton um, you know, would lose, uh, that Hillary Clinton would win. And this was the 15. It's the equivalent of flipping a coin four times and getting all heads. Doesn't happen often, but it happens. I mean, that's my take on it. I mean, I don't know about my colleagues. Yeah, that's that, that's about the equivalent of rolling a dice, of rolling a dice and getting a one on it. It's going to happen, you know, one sixth of the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And and yeah. a lot of this is how you you know you 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 frame results. So you know, so so Jeff, if you tell me um, there's there's an eighty five percent chance that it's going to be a clear day. And so I take that as reason not to take my umbrella. And then it starts pouring and you, you come back and you say, well, there was always this 15%. I told you, yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 I told you so. I, and, I, I'm, and I'm not gonna buy it, right? Yeah, no. Um, yeah. <laughs> so again, I think the, 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 more I, the more I think about this is, you know, there's, I, I, I don't think I don't think polling is 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 dead, but I think you know we're we're fighting this losing battle because I think a lot of way in a lot of ways when we're using polling methodology to essentially make predictions about election outcomes, uh, you know it's it could be one of these cases where we're, use, we're not using the tool in quite the way it was intended to be used. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, because I get, I, I'm sure you all are asked questions by students, you know, well, who, who, who's gonna win, right? And, and, and that's a question I hate answering because I, I don't wanna make predictions. And I tell students that I don't think that's our business as political scientists. We're not in the prediction business, we're in the explanation business. And, and, and they don't want to hear that, right? Because they think I'm being, they think I'm being mealy mouth um, and, and cowardly. And I suppose I am, but you know. <laughs> well, I predicted Trump would lose in 2014. And I, I stuck by that predict that eventually he would uh, self-destruct. And I stuck by that prediction. I think finally I'm right, you know, six years later. <laughs> um, I, I actually had one prediction that was right too, Jeff. Um, in, in 2016, I predicted that neither Hillary Clinton nor Donald Trump would be president in February of 21. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, so I thought, I, no, here, I, here's, here was my thinking is that if Clinton had won, you know, okay, uh, but then she would be, uh, if, if she ran for reelection, she would be seeking a fourth consecutive democratic term. And that's yeah. really hard to get, right? Yeah. 
And I figured Trump would, if Trump won, he would just be Trump and he would lose. Um, I, I, and I was only right because of the pandemic, I think, but, uh, but and, and that's, that's, that's a high cost for being right, I, I, I will admit. Uh, but, uh, but I think that, uh, but, but I was right about that one prediction. That, that also is, a, there's, a, there's another thing, and, and, um, and uh, thank you, Caitlin, for the, or, or the uh, uh, audience members for, the, for that question. Um, I think that um, political science is more than polling, um, and, and even yeah. in the study of elections, political science is more than polling. Um, we also do other kinds of things. There are people who do interesting forecast models that try to give you a baseline prediction of given the state of the economy and given the president's uh, popularity historically, what would you expect? Um, and there are other, other kinds of variables that go into these, these, um, these forecast models as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, some of those forecast models actually did pretty well, right? And, and they're, they only kind of give you the baseline. It's the, you know, what the candidates are doing on the campaign trail and how, you know, and, and how they're responding to events and responding to each other and debates and the nature of the campaign are going to shift things two or three points away from whatever that baseline is. But we pretty much know, I think, as political scientists, what the baseline is going to be going into an election. Question. One of our uh, people at home asked, uh, is there a way or how could pollsters use uh, social media outlets to target younger voter samples? Is that a possibility or are social media platforms just evil because they um, <laughs> spread information, and if I may so, in many cases, misinformation so quickly. Sure. It, but is it a tool that pollsters could use to reach part of the demographic that they're having difficulty reaching? For, firms, survey firms are already experimenting with this and, and using social media as, as, a, as, as a platform for, um, yeah, it's, it, that, will, that will be part of the future. I mean, yeah, those, is that 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 is being pursued? Okay, not surprising. No, Chris and Caitlin, and back out at Albion College, I keep overshadowing you. Do you have questions? Either yeah. of you? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, so, do you guys think that there's any connection between the idea of a shy Trump voter and the lack of rural polling? And I, I mean this in the idea that. If Republicans who are in uh, urban and suburban areas, um, they're probably most likely to be surrounded by more Democrats, um, and it might be socially unacceptable um, or viewed as socially unacceptable um, to vote for Trump. Um, whereas a Republican in a rural area um, is probably surrounded by more Republicans, um, and therefore it's a lot more uh, socially acceptable to support Trump. Um, and therefore, they'd probably be the more loud kind of Trump supporter, if you will. Um, so do you guys think that there's a connection there? Julio, I think the, the study that you cited would suggest that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think no, the, the, the things connect up there in, in a way. Yeah, that, that makes sense, you yeah. know. So uh, just as a, um, so I think that 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 points to the dual problems of polling, right? Though the um, so so the premise of your question is you may have a lot of Trump voters in rural areas all over the country, right? Um, the problem is getting them into the polls, right? That, that's the representation problem, right? Yep. Um, you know, getting them to answer the phone, and you know, and for the and and if you're trying to do an internet poll, you know, making sure enough of them have access to the internet uh, that they're going to that they're going to be part of the sample. So that's the representation part of it. When you move to urban areas, that's probably less of a problem. Um, I think you still have declining response rates in urban and suburban areas too, uh, but but uh, but you don't have the access problem that you do uh, if, with with rural areas. But then but then you might get the um, you might get the uh, the social desirability thing among 
um, you know, sort of, uh, as Julio was saying, sort of well-educated uh, voters who might then be, who, who might support Trump, but be shy about saying that. So I think that, that that's a pretty good observation, but it points to the, um, the, the dual problems of representation and measurement, um, uh, measurement in polls. By the way, Ted asked whether there would be a shy uh, Biden voter. And I don't, uh, I have a friend who lives in rural Mississippi and she's a Democrat. She says she's the only one there. So, uh, so she might be that kind of example. Of that, so. yeah. I have another question, but Caitlin, let me give you a chance if you have something that you just have to, you have to get out. Sure. Well, Dr. Martinez actually started answering my question, but um, I was kind of wondering, like, what kind of specific things does polling need to do in order to modernize and make sure it stays relevant and accurate in our modern political climate? Um, I, I think we always have the same problems. It's just that those problems evolve because of technology and how people react to the technology, right? Um, so, so we have the problem of of sampling, of getting good samples um, in, in eras of declining response rates, that, um, that's, a, that's a challenge. And we have the problem of um, asking questions in a way that will elicit responses that are measuring the concepts that we want to measure. Uh, and, and those continue to be problems and, and they evolve because technologies change and, and the problems change, uh, our political environment changes. Um, and um, so, so I think it's, um, it, you know, getting, uh, I think, um, it, it's, as, as I think we started with, um, you know, Jeff pointed out, it's the bad polls that get the press. Um, we may not be in a, quite as bad shape as everybody says, right? Yeah. It's just that the bad polls are the salient ones that get the press. Um, and, um, and, and so it may be, um, it may be that, that as we need to do a better job of educating the media and educating the public, um, we are, as political scientists are trained to think about uncertainty and, and uh, in our uh, estimates of reality, um, where the media tend to try to focus, they like the hard numbers and, and sometimes the numbers just aren't that hard. Yeah. But, you know, an example of that where the numbers aren't hard, not in political science. Um, I had a friend and his wife just gave birth and the child was, um, there were many medical compl complications. And he asked about the odds. What are the probabilities of success of the child living in this case? And the physician absolutely refused to answer um, because he didn't want to build false hope or anything like that. And yet the person, the father, would have found those probabilities comforting, you know, knowing that there was a 1%, 5%, 10% chance, whatever. Um, and that just, again, illustrates that most of the public is very uncomfortable dealing in probabilities. And again, we, like Michael said, there's uncertainty in everything we uh, predict. And we have to, we can't change that. We have to make people comfortable with that. We can't change it. Yeah, a couple of questions from people at home. One was, uh, do you know of theorists, people who are studying turnout rates? Um, and, and the other, the real point here is, did anyone really predict the surge of both Republican and Democratic voters in 2020? Huge turnout. Uh, my colleague, Michael McDonald did. Uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Michael is one of the premier experts in, in the study of turnout in the United States. Um, and um, if you look at, um, if you Google his name, Michael McDonald, US election project, you'll find his data. He's, he's got a wealth of data that he uh, freely, um, freely um, um, puts on the website so anybody can use it. Um, but, but he did. Uh, um, I, I, I don't know if he predicted the exact level of turnout, but he did predict the surge here. Um, and I think it was based on the level of, um, of interest um, by both Trump supporters and Trump opponents, right? I mean, Trump was the, he was the big fish in, the, in, in this. Uh, and, you know, so there were people who Trump uh, mobilized and, and brought into the electorate in 2016. 
uh, and they stayed with him. Um, and he mobilized others uh, during his presidency. Um, but he also mobilized a lot of Democro Democrats as well. Uh, and, and so I think, um, I, I think the, and, and not only that, but there's been sort of a secular, even before um, 16, there's been a little bit of a secular bump up uh, in, in turnout rates. I mean, we're a long way from where we were in 1992 in terms of turnout in the United States. A skeptic might ask whether poll results sometimes drive human behavior rather than predicting it or measuring it. Is that a fair criticism? I would say, well, it depends, which is what political scientists always say. Yeah, um, lawyer. yeah it depends. There, there were studies years ago where um, people in Hawaii and California wouldn't vote because the presidential race had already been called. Now that didn't change opinions, but it did change turnout. Do I think polls actually change people's opinions? I, I'm, I haven't seen anything on that, but I'm skeptical. I mean, anybody? Yes, I'm sure a few, but generally I'm skeptical. And I don't know about how my colleagues feel about that. Well, I mean, if, if, if we're go going back to the shy Trump voter argument, that, that would be a case of at least some subset of Trump supporters being sensitive to what they think the climate of public opinion is and adjusting their, their demeanor in response, right? But they're, it doesn't change these their calculations vote. that expressing support for, for Donald Trump is going to get me into some kind of trouble. It's going to be embarrassing. I'm going to get yelled at um, and I'm not going to do it. Yeah, but that doesn't um, change their vote. It just changed their willingness to talk to us. Well, I mean, that's... That's a behavior, I suppose. Well, yeah. Um, but the, 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 other, the other thing, though, where sometimes poll results and, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask both, both Jeff and Michael to, to, to help me out on this one. But I, I think there, I, I know there has been some research that's, that's looked at the extent to which poll results is correlated with um, making campaign contributions. In the, and the ability of, of, of candidates to raise money, that the when candidates start to falter in the polls, they yeah. run into trouble raising money because voters are seeing, or potential donors, I should say, are looking at these poll numbers and having second thoughts about writing a check to a candidate who perhaps is headed toward defeat. Um, you know, that would be a case where poll results and, and, the, and, the, and the consumption of poll results is altering some decisions. In this case, the decision to contribute financially to a candidate. Sure. Um, yeah, Gary Jacobson's theory on um, midterm elections, where the basically the elites determine how who they're going to give money to based on polls. What I think it was a, a year before they actually happen. Um, that would support that. I don't think the poll. I don't think it's so sensitive that someone goes down two points this week and people stop giving money. Um, but I think, yeah, when it becomes clear that a candidate's not going to do it, um, you know, why waste your money? I, I think where, where you're more likely to see that is actually in presidential primaries, right? Sure. Uh, if you get a very, um, if you get a big uh, cont uh, contested primary, um, so we had that. Um, we had that on the Democratic side uh, this time. We had it on both sides in 2016, uh, but, but a little more on the Republican side, um, is uh, that I think um, Bartel's old book on presidential primaries talks about you know, the expectations and preferences. Polls are part of the expectations. It's not the only thing. And right. I think you're right, Jeff, is that um, and, and, and Julio, I think you're right that you're going to get some, some of that dynamic as what donors are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and right. Um, but, but I think you, you will see that may be the place where you're going to see that, right? So people need to start performing well. And, um, you know, what we call the invisible primaries, 
um, you know, the polls and raising money and all of that stuff before Iowa even, you know, opens the caucus doors. Uh, so. I, I don't want to interrupt here, but we're only going to getting kind of toward the end of our time together. And I wanted to give one more chance for Caitlin or Chris from, from Albion College to raise a question with any of you, if, if you'd like. No pressure. I do actually have a question that might be good to kind of end on. Um, I guess kind of, so is there a way to predict voter behavior in a way that actually helps us or should we just give up? I guess is my question. Oh, it, it depends what you mean helps us. Um, political scientists are not your standard person. We, um, <laughs> I mean, as a case in point, I used to like watching C-SPAN. And then when I got married and have children, you know, they wouldn't stand for it, but I found it enjoyable. Um, we're, so we're different. Is it helpful to us? Yeah. Is it helpful to other people? Well, to candidates, I'd say, yeah, they spend enough money on it. Is it helpful to the average voter other than satisfying their curiosity or, or their paranoia? Um, you know, I don't know. I'd, I'd say it's just interesting to them. Yeah. Chris? I guess... Right before um, Caitlin's question, you guys mentioned how much of a, an effect polling uh, can have on donations, or at least somewhat th that is. Have, have there ever been any, like, I guess, cited times or examples of a uh, pollster or, or polling organization, you know, kind of abusing their power or, you know, um, maybe bias in polling, anything like that? Well, I think there are lots of examples of biased polling. Um, right. You know, if you go to 538, they list all these polls and they tell you this one leans Democrat, this one leans Republican. I don't think you'd see, even if your clients are mostly Republicans, I don't think you'd see a poll which would be so biased towards Republicans that it wouldn't make any sense because they're still trying to if they're private pollsters, they're still trying to sell their service. If it's a political scientist, they're still trying to build a reputation. So I don't think you'll see anything incredibly blatant. But is there bias polling? Um, yeah, of course. And, and there may be uh, in, in, in the network or in the media environment where we live, right? So there's all kinds of media outlets. Media may be selective in the polls that they, or some media may be selective in the polls that they talk about. Um, and, and so it may not be that the polls are biased, but the, but the meat, but some media outlets may be selective or biased and in, in the polls that they talk about and talk about polls that would make their candidate look more favorable or, or not. I have a question I'd like to ask all the participants. And that is when you get a poll, when you get a call, how many of you actually respond and participate in the poll with a show of hand? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Can that, we show our I mean, hand that way? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's sort of part of, I mean, but that sort of illustrates part of the problem. I mean, I stopped doing it because they'd ask me a question. I'd say, that's not the way to ask that question, you know? <laughs> um, and you have some guy who's making $10 an hour or something like that. They don't want to hear that. Right. Oh. So, yeah. Right. Have, I get have, I get consumer surveys saying, you know, would you recommend this uh, restaurant to a friend? And I'm like, no, because you know Jeff and Julio are my friends. They're adults. They can choose the restaurants they want to go to. <laughs> uh, just, just out of curiosity. Oh, I, I I'm sorry, I didn't. No, go ahead, Julio. No, I was just wondering. Yeah, we we all get we all get the sort of junkie polls. Has has anyone ever been, for example, contacted by Gallup? you know, by, by one of the genuine heavy hitters. I, I was a GSS respondent back in the 1980s. Were you? Oh, yeah, wow. General Social Survey. Yeah. I knew it was a general social survey because they were asking about, um, uh, they, they were asking the uh, questions about, um, do you approve of certain relationships? So this was back in the 1980s, right? Mm -hmm. So they were saying like, you do approve of uh, 
you know, a heterosexual man and a heterosexual woman, and then they went for, you know, a gay man and a gay man and a, and, mm -hmm. and a you know, a, a two heterosexuals of different races. Um, and it, uh, so, uh, so I knew that set of questions on GSS, so I knew I was a, a general social service <laughs> respondent. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. This has been a great hour. Uh, I want to thank especially uh, uh, Chris Kerber and uh, Caitlin Cummings from Albion College. Uh, you see there uh, my friend Patrick McLean, head of the Ford Institute at Albion, uh, who has helped make this all possible and gotten students to participate. Thank you especially to Michael Martinez, Julio Borges, and Jeff Hill, uh, doctors Michael, Julio, and Jeff for joining us tonight from different parts of the country and contributing to, uh, to this conversation. I want to tell you that a month from now on March 24, we will have a conversation with David Shipler, Pulitzer Prize winning author, former reporter and bureau chief for the New York Times. Uh, his appearance has been made possible by our partnership with Albion College, Patrick McLean, whom I mentioned, and the Gerald R. Ford Institute for Leadership in Public Policy and Service. And we're grateful for them. Uh, keep watching the website. You'll see more about that. We'll talk about the topic. Uh, that is going to be uh, uh, just another great evening as we continue our American values from the War Memorial in Gross Point. Thank you and good night. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. You're yeah, welcome. My pleasure.